Good, um, good morning, Joachim Pissarro. I'm a professor of artistry at Hunter College. And uh, I have had the immense, almost lifelong uh, honor, privilege, and, uh, and happiness to, to know Rick Bretel, Dr. Richard Robson Bretel, um, through, through decades of, um, of common work. And uh, all this started, in fact, around, uh, around Pissarro in several ways. Um, uh, I'm not going to, to, this would take way too long to summarize uh, 35 years, 40 years almost, of common friendship and collaboration in 10 minutes. That's impossible. So let me jump straight to the point. We're at the Dallas Museum of Art, and one of the key works at the DNA is, of course, the notoriously great uh, Apple Harvest, 1888, by, by Calio Pissarro. As you all know, uh, Bretel was... Uh, I could say almost Pissarro reincarnated in the 20th and 21st century. He um, definitely wrote the definitive uh, uh, work on Pissarro's um, earlier period, on Pissarro's impressionist, pre impressionist, and impressionist period, the so called Pontoise years. But it's interesting that Bretel didn't decide to call it the impressionist period, but focused on a topos, on the place where uh, Pissarro lived. So here we are not in Pontoise at all. This is uh, about four years after Pissarro abandoned Pontoise and uh, moved, relocated with his uh, large family, uh, five, five kids uh, and, and numerous relations and friends who were always in this huge house. And it's a small village uh, out about an hour and a half at the time from Paris. Uh, today it would be a little faster, but it's uh, very much a rural space around me. And um, what what Rick uh, and I, in fact, uh, found out is that around this particular painting, there's a, a total re revolution almost uh, that happens uh, at, at this particular juncture. Uh, whereby Pissarro, who by that time is no longer a young man at all, he's in his mid fifties, uh, late fifties, in fact, uh, and he uh, reinvents himself, almost rejuvenates himself. Like you, uh, some of you may know the Lucas Cranach extraordinary painting in Berlin, where uh, all the people enter into uh, the, the, the font of Juventia, the rejuvenating, rejuvenating basin, and go out on the other side, uh, being young people again, uh, a dream for many of us. Well, so that's a little bit what happens with Pissarro uh, around this particular painting. In 1888, um, already two years in the making, Pissarro turns into a neo-impressionist, uh, a newborn impressionist, you might say. He follows the example of Sora, everybody knows that, but really inflects it with his own sense of poetry, of rural dreams, of anarchism. Uh, he is a very uh, committed uh, believer in people, in people's lives, people's freedoms, people's independence. And that's something that Richard Bretel uh, has spent a lot of time also recently, more recently, when he did this extraordinary exhibition at the Clark called Pissarro's People, which I really invite you to look at, uh, look at the catalog again. And you will see that those people that you see in this very painting are, in effect, the subject matter of uh, Bretel's uh, scholarship and, and deep humanistic uh, attention. What I, I find it interesting that, in fact, uh, it was 1988, we already knew each other for almost 10 years, uh, Bretel and I, um, in 1988, therefore, exactly 100 years after uh, the apple harvest, Bretel calls me and says, I was in London at the time, uh, why don't you come to, to Dallas? I just uh, became the, I uh, was appointed the new director of the Dallas Museum of Art, and I would like you to think about an exhibition project for uh, this institution. We could work together. And I came up with this idea of looking into the series of Pissarro's painting at the time. Nobody had really looked at the fact that if you look at the catalog resume, you saw dozens and dozens of little images that all depict the same subject matter. But if you look at them in black and white, you don't get 
the sense of how much variety, diversity, interest uh, there is in each different moment of those uh, of those series. So that's I uh, that's exactly what prompted my visit to Dallas in 1988, uh, and we spent a lot of time, uh, Rick and I, in front of this painting, looking at it. Uh, of course, it was this was not in the exhibition, but it was a kind of almost a, a counterpoint in uh, in the back, in the uh, John Sebastian back uh, sense. You know, it was a kind of contrast to what we were trying to do, which started the series of cities, views of cities, uh, only a few years after the, the apple harvest. And Pissarro was able to join both sides very deftly, very beautifully. In fact, what you need to know perhaps about Rick Rittell is that about the multifaceted uh, scholarships. I'd like to use the term in, in plural, though it sounds a little strange, but uh, Rick was many scholars. He was not, and, and by the way, I'm not going to, to even discuss uh, his fields of interest outside uh, what we call Western 19th century, Western European painting, uh, which he was a great great specialist of, but he was also a specialist of architecture and of so many different things. No, not enough time to go into this, but what you need to know is that, uh, in fact, um, going back now one decade before, in 1978, uh, Bretel had just finished his PhD at Yale on the, the, the work I was telling you about, and immediately he was teaching, Laurie Groom was one of his students, uh, he was working with with Christopher Lloyd, uh, you know, he's, he's, this is also a typical Rick, you know, barely out of school, he's already producing not one but two or three books and exhibitions. And he was working on the catalogue resume of the drawings of the Ashmolean Museum, the catalogue resume of Pissarro's drawings at the Ashmolean Museum. And in that catalogue resume, you find, uh, he was doing that with Christopher Lloyd, you find many studies, you find in fact that Pissarro that was his claim with, with uh, Chris Lloyd, um, was as prolific and was perhaps as important as a draftsman during the Impressionist years as Degas was uh, in, in terms of the pro their production of works on paper. So here you have a, a, a perfect example, but there are many. In fact, you could say that this apple harvest generated, yielded a whole harvest of other drawings, or, or maybe to put it in a different way that this harvest of drawings resulted in the, the apple harvest that you have at the Dallas Museum. So that was also, uh, that was very curious because um, at the time, you know, this was, I'm talking about 1978 when, when Bretel and Lloyd created this new chapter in the scholarship of Impressionism, whereby one looked at uh, the preparatory works and Pissarro was, as I said, one of the most prolific ones. There's no question about that. And what that uh, kind of uh, uh, stopped us thinking about is the fact that the preconceived idea we had that uh, Impressionism was this sort of spontaneous, uh, immediate, direct response, physical response, sensual response to uh, what we see um, outside. Well, that of course, there's an element, there's a very deep element of, of truth in this, but it's not the full picture. And the full picture needs to take into consideration the fact that uh, Pissarro produced dozens and dozens of drawings in order to hone in, perhaps, more carefully, more precisely, more directly on his own so-called sensations, his own sensations, a term he happily shared with another great artist, a very good friend, uh, Cézanne, Paul Cézanne, la, la petite sensation, Cézanne said, my little sensation. So that little sensation was not something that you just, that a spark that came out uh, uh, immediately. It was something that you had to work on. In fact, there is a, uh, a beautiful sentence, a beautiful quote that uh, I'm giving you from <laughs> citation from memory, so please, uh, if you check the exact words, don't be upset if I'm missing a word or two. But he says to his son, Lucien, to his eldest son, who is in London at the time, uh, gives him this fundamental piece of advice. And he says, you must be yourself. 
one must be oneself. But, he says, he adds, Pissarro adds, one cannot become oneself without making great efforts. So that's a paradox right there and then. You know, it's a huge paradox. You have to become, to be yourself. Well, we all are ourselves. And you just, it was like being in a, in a shrink's uh, office. You, you just you pour out yourself uh, almost automatically. No, according to Pissarro, in order to become yourself, you have to, huge paradox, work on it. You, it's, it's like a, a gymnastic. It's like a, a, a workout. Uh, and it's a, perhaps like a psychoanalytical cure. You don't return to yourself automatically. It goes through screens and screens and levels and levels of arduous efforts. And you see some of these efforts here on the screen. Uh, so, in other words, what, what uh, Brettel revealed right back then in the late 1970s and early 80s is that the notion of Impressionism that we had carried through for, for generations and generations was only partial and that what had been kind of uh, left out, omitted, um, obliterated, uh, censored in a way, like a you know, psychoanalytical cure again, was the fact that uh, there was this whole enterprise of, uh, of direct, simple mark makings on a, on a sheet of paper, as you can see with this, this, uh, this, this other study of the, the guy goaling uh, apples um, in the uh, in the apple harvest, and uh, that it was through this kind of apprenticeship that has to be renewed in front of almost every single painting that uh, Pissarro reached out his uh, eventual uh, result, his eventual uh, eventual goal. Um, it's interesting what what Richard Bretel did do is that he really looked at the two sides of that one coin, because way later, in fact, one of his last, uh, one, his penultimate exhibition on Pissarro, the last one was the one we curated together in 2017 in Paris, uh, which was on Erani, and his painting was very much uh, at, the, at the core of the exhibition. Uh, in a few years before, I mentioned it before, at the Clark Institute, he created that exhibition called uh, Pissarro's People, and he also did something extraordinary at the Clark Institute called painting quickly. So when I mentioned the paradox, it's, it's really uh, essential, I think, to try to see that it is a paradox and not a contradiction. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. And what I mean by that is that the notion of painting quickly is not eradicated, is not uh, obstructed by the fact that Pissarro builds up these levels and levels and levels of reflection on paper, of drawing, of, of, of uh, putting his marks down on paper in order to reach finally the, the ultimate result he's seeking after. So that's exactly the transliteration. I mean, uh, what you're seeing through those slides uh, is a kind of uh, almost a live demonstration of what Pissarro was able to do, of what, of how he was essentially working, which is far more complex than we perhaps have tended to uh, understand it. But at the same time, it absolutely does not deny the fact, Bretel insisted on that, and rightly so, that uh, uh, Pissarro ultimately would always resort to that uh, deep, uh, a uh, sense of immediacy was thriving on going back to that to that inner spark. So these drawings, these these watercolors, these washes, these numerous works on paper were again only there in order to hone in on that particular inner spark that would generate the final work itself. So no contradiction at all. Kind of very complex, rich fascinating uh, dialogue with himself, in constant dialogue with himself. Um, and so to maybe close uh, our, our remark, what I would like to say is that uh, you see this in the first image uh, that um, we looked at together, where you see both Camille Pissarro and, and Richard Bretel uh, together, almost smiling at each other. I, I would say that 
Um, I would conclude, in fact, with a, a sentence by Freud, and I feel that Richard Bretel um, uh, somehow uh, refuted one of the big principles of Freud's uh, psychoanalysis. In the old of the late, I mean, Freud, he was uh, just a few years before he died, I think it was 1939 or so, uh, Freud wrote a, a book called New Lectures on Psychoanalysis, you can find it, and there he says something extraordinary. He says, you don't and you can't psychoanalyze dead people. Well, I think that Richard Robson Brettel psychoanalyzed Camille Pissarro and brought him to life. We love him for that. Thank you, Rick.